My name is Tom, your host and friend with WeaponsEducation.com. Thank you, welcome, and we got Frank back on the channel. Historian, Marine, and if there's a person who's patriotic, it's Frank. This man, his bio is all about American history. Being a Marine, serving overseas, his son serves as a Marine. He has mentored tens of thousands of children over 12 years at a museum specifically dedicated to all the world wars we've had to protect us Americans in the United States. Patriotic Frank is back on the channel to talk about Iwo Jima. And uh, first of all, Frank, what's going on with that exact war? That's the focus of this video. It's, of course, past tense. Everyone says World War II was the big one. Yep. Was it the big one? Ultimately, the largest scale war in the history of mankind. You, you know, you got to put the magnitude alone. It lasted really... When you, when you factor in when the country started getting involved from the 19, mid-1930s into 1945, uh, in September of 1945. But World War II, just to give you a scale of how large that war, over 60 million people worldwide died during World War II. And it was fought in, uh, from the Eastern Hemisphere to the Western Hemisphere and across all of our oceans. Uh, Iwo Jima, the bloodiest battle since Gettysburg for the United States. Uh, i give you numbers. 6,824 of our Marines, sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Coast Guardsmen died on that island. 19,000 wounded. On the flip side, Tom, nearly 20,000 Japanese troops were killed. Less than 1,000 surrendered. In fact, the last two to surrender surrendered in 19... 51. They resisted. They were hiding for six years. You know, it's, it's hard to believe that's a small island. All that death and destruction happened on an island that's only five miles long, three and a half miles wide. No one realizes how small it is. It's really small. You can get from one end to another in a short period of time, and there's very little vegetation. I had the honor and privilege of going there 10 years ago, nearly 10 years ago, and uh, it was really an amazing experience. Um, uh, really, I, I've been to the Vatican, okay? I've been to a lot of famous landmarks in our world, and uh, but it was very spiritual to be there, very spiritual, and, I, and it was very moving to see the veterans and, and their advanced age right now uh, come to peace uh, with themselves and, and be able to be reunited with a lot of their brothers that, that they served with. But uh, well, let's yeah. talk yeah. about that exact battle. Mm -hmm. uh, why did it start and the the flag and, yeah. and the historic portion well, of it let's talk you, you you might have heard of the the term island hopping okay that was a, a term that was used because we had so many islands in the pacific of course hawaii got hit in december 7th of 1941 pearl harbor and we started advancing towards the japanese coast and we had to hit a lot of different little islands going all the way close to new zealand all the way up uh, to, 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 to the northern Antilles up there by Alaska, and believe it or not, that area was also occupied by the Japanese. And uh, we needed Iwo because Iwo was a big jump so that we can get our bombers over to Japan and be able to lay some good, uh, good uh, ordnance on the enemy. Um, you know, those planes back in those days, Tom, they didn't have mid-air refueling, okay? And, uh, you know, they had to just carry bombs. They carried the bare minimum, and they barely had enough to drop their ordnance on a target and then turn around safely and get back to base. So Iwo was instrumental because it has a, uh, an airstrip, and they were able to launch a lot of bombing missions into All Japan. right, so my first thought mm -hmm. is, because you're the historian now, did we bomb the hell out of it yes. before yes. our human military troops actually hit yes. the, the, the ground yeah. running? That happens even today in a, in, a, in a modern right. in a battlefield. You always want to prep the battlefield. Right. And, uh, and, and there's an interesting story about that because, uh, you know, uh, Admiral Nimitz um, actually cut off 
uh, the amount of prep time on it. Uh, we were supposed to bomb uh, Iwo Jima for 10 days, naval gunfire, airstrikes, things like that. Uh, because and what ended up happening, the reason why Nimitz cut it off short was he needed to save that am ammunition for other battles such as Okinawa and possibly uh, other parts of mainland Japan. So, uh, you know, Howling Mad Smith, which was the Marine General uh, who led the, the, the three divisions, uh, third, fourth, and fifth Marine divisions that landed on Iwo, uh, you know, he was a little upset with that. So we saturated it for several days. Uh, in fact, I've spoken to uh, veterans of the battle uh, and they were off the coast uh, looking at the island, which was full of smoke. And they, and they were convinced that, that nothing was going to happen, okay? We already had uh, bombed the, uh, the enemy to submission. Boy, was that a mistake. Because they landed on that beach, and the Japanese were not foolish. They're very, very intelligent warriors, Tom. They drew them in and made sure that they were on that beach. And let me talk about that beach a little bit. It's not like the beaches we have here in Florida and all over the world and other parts of our country, you know, nice sand that you can walk on. We were not very sure about the texture of the sand of that island. And, you know, we had done reconnaissance missions and photographs and stuff, and they thought it was just black sand. Well, in reality, it's volcanic ash from the highest point of that island, which is Mount Sarabachi. Okay, it's 550 uh, feet above sea level, and uh, it's been, you know, erupting many, many times over thousands of years, and that's how the island was built. So that whole island is full of volcanic ash. Well, when you step in it, it's not like the sand we have here in these beaches. You're, you're, you know, it's very difficult. So here we got all these amphibious vehicles, Amtraks, and, and, and alligators at the time they called them, and Jeeps and trucks, and they were getting on this stuff, and they were getting stuck. And our guys were getting pinned down, so the Japanese drew us in one wave after another, one wave after another, and the guys thought, nah, there's not much going on. The enemy's done. There might be a few alive, but nah, they're prompt. They drew us in, and then they opened up the guns. And it was so it came out of their caves? Or well, you had Mount Sarabachi, tunnels? and they had tunnels, and they had five-inch guns, and our Talk guys were... Talk about the weaponry. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the weaponry, uh, you know, Japanese had Type 92 machine guns, Type 96 machine guns. What caliber? Uh, uh, very oddball calibers. I can't recall at this very moment, but... but uh, Excellent machine guns. They were very well skilled. Uh, Type 99 was their main uh, bolt action rifle that they carried. Uh, but, you know, they opened it up with their, their um, uh, gun emplacements in Sarabachi and um, drew our guys in, and then it was a turkey shoot. In fact, I, I, I venture to say that half of those uh, nearly 7,000 that we lost happened within the first 48 hours on that beach. And, and to tell you a little bit about the beach, and I want to give this to you, Tom. Uh, this is real volcanic ash from Mount Sarabachi uh, on Iwo Jima, and uh, it's very special because uh, the blood of our wonderful troops is soaked in that. Thank you, that sir. Sand. I mean, and you're a Marine, way. coming from you and your son being a well, Marine, and you went there personally and retrieved this. Yeah. This will be sitting here. Well, you know something I tell people, Iwo Jima is very, very important to the United States, Mar States Marine. Uh, the example I give people is Catholics have the Vatican, okay? Uh, you know, Christianity and Judaism has Jerusalem, Israel. Uh, Islam has Mecca. Marines have Iwo Jima. Uh, it uh, really was a defining moment. Everyone knows about Joseph Rosenthal's the Pulitzer Prize no, award-winning photograph. I don't think everyone does know. Talk well, about that. Well, well, they know about the photograph. They know about that famous photograph of six Marines raising the flag. It's a really awesome photograph. Uh, Tom, that's the most reproduced photograph in the history of photography. There are more copies of that than anything, including Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin on the moon. And... Uh, it was on every newspaper. See, now, what a lot yeah. of people think, I'm guessing, is that was the end of the battle. 
No. Right? No, but it wasn't. No, no, no. It was not. You're absolutely That's I'm glad correct. you pointed it out. Yeah. The battle lasted 36 days, okay? And the first few days, like I was explaining earlier, uh, was really, really rough. You know, the morale was down. We were pinned down. We didn't know how many Japanese were still on there. And, and quite honestly, things were slipping and they were starting to look a lot better for the enemy. And uh, these guys... Uh, had to take up the flag, but let me tell you a little bit about the story about the flag. Uh, the Secretary of the Navy, James Forrestal, had come off of a landing craft with ha General Howling Mad Smith, and everybody says, why do they call him Howling Mad? Because he yelled all the time, okay? That's why they called him Howling Mad Smith, and he was really, really a great guy, a great tactician, and he comes off the landing craft with uh, James Forrestal, and, uh, you know, there was a small flag that Marines had put up there initially, okay, away from that famous photograph. And when Forrestal saw that, he said, you see that Holland Mad? That's a Marine Corps for the next 500 years. I want that flag. I want that flag in my office, okay? I want to display that thing. That's awesome. We take, we're taking this place. Send up another flag that's a little bigger so the boys can see it and they can get motivated. And that's what happened. These guys took it up there. Slowly as they went slowly, up. It's a, slowly as they went up. They grabbed this big pipe that was some kind of a communication antenna. And they hooked on the flag and they raised it. And this guy, Joseph Rosenthal, he was an Associated Press photographer. Okay, He had followed these guys with that flag, and he was hoping to get something of a decent picture. And in fact, the fellow that was next to, him, next to him that was doing the videotaping had to nudge him really quick and say, Hey, look, look, take your picture, take your picture. And he just threw up the camera, and he took that photograph. Let's take a look at that photograph right now. Let me tell you a little a story about that. Now, Joe Rosenthal, his job with the Associated Press, of course, was to report and take photographs of, of, of what was going on in the war. When he came off the landing craft that morning, he accidentally dropped his camera into the water. And, and, and he was upset. He was really upset. He was worried because not only did you know he needed to take pictures, he didn't have a backup camera. So he dried that camera off the best he could and he took hundreds of photographs. Now remember folks, it's not like today where you can instantly check and see how well your pictures came. They had to be developed. He had to send them to a laboratory far, far away. So it took days, okay, to get that developed. Believe it or not, and this is where divine intervention comes in folks, the frame prior and the frame after were damaged. That one was preserved. Those six guys that raised that flag up on Mount Sarabachi inspired the world. It really got us going in this country. It got us finally the sense that we can win this thing. Okay, you know, the United States had gone through a lot, numerous years of bloodshed, sacrifice. You know, we were rationing. Okay, there was a lack of fuel in this country. And finally, we get this photograph, this majestic photograph of our finest, raising those beautiful stars and stripes on top of, a, of an enemy position. So that inspired our people, and it inspired those troops that were down there. What did the What did the Japs do uh, if if they were captured? Would they uh, easily be taken as prisoner? Or would... Well, most of them took their own lives. Yeah. To be quite honest with you, because they they have that warrior samurai bushido uh, culture over there. Uh, a lot of them uh, fell under their own hands. Now there were some that did uh, surrender uh, honorably. Um, but uh, it's amazing because I actually met a veteran of the battle, uh, a Japanese a veteran, and uh, I was talking to him in the island of Guam, which is nearby, and I said, gee, I'm really looking forward to going to the island with you and to hear what you have to say. And he says, no, I'm not going to the island. My people don't look at our veterans the way your country looks at your veterans. That says something about us. It really does, Tom. Let's talk about our, our weapon bring. Um, the 1911, please, Tammy, take a zoom in on this 1911. This happens to be an Ivor Johnson. Yeah. Gosh, guys, this is a this is really a good buy for you. It's out there. It's a nice piece. 650 bucks. Look how gorgeous this thing is. Can't beat it. Let's talk about the 1911 yeah. and what the GIs did. How did it help them during that battle? 1911. Well, you know, great creation of John Moses Browning, uh, the most prolific uh, 
pistol. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, even to this day, here we are, uh, 115, 116 years later, and it's still okay, constantly so, being used. And now, what about the gear? What mm -hmm. type of gear did the Americans wear to get mm -hmm. up that 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 volcano? Uh, well, you know, they had their standard brown boots, leather boots, uh, which were not uh, waterproof. Um, you know, they had their olive drabs, uh, various different uh, uniforms uh, with leggings. They used to call it leggings because it would cover and protect their shins and their and their and their and their ankles. Um, you know, steel pot helmet. Keep in mind, folks, they didn't have bulletproof vests, <laughs> ballistic vests back then. Uh, they were carrying a lot of ammunition, okay? Uh, you know, the M1 Grand is a 30 odd six. That's right. It's a lot heavier than that 5.56 five, that our troops normally carry now. Uh, hand grenades, food, water, rations, you know, and a lot of things that pe people don't realize is infantrymen not only have to carry their gear, but they have to carry the gear of others because mortarmen, machine gunners, they take spare ammunition with them. So How did we ultimately win the battle? Pure will. Pure, unadulterated will. The fighting American is the most unstoppable thing on the face of the earth because of many, many reasons. First of all, we believe in freedom. We want to have what we, ha we want to give what we have to others. It doesn't always work well, that, Tom, but uh, this country uh, really has been blessed. God has truly uh, laid his hands on us, and we should be fortunate, very fortunate. Yeah, so we had lost, you know the exact amount of men we lost, 6,824 6, is where they're at right now. Yeah. 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 And how many days did the battle last? 36 days. 36 days. Oh, yeah, worse since Gettysburg and Tinum. The numbers were gigantic. Yeah. There you go, folks. We can never forget. No. We can never forget what our veterans did to give us the freedoms we have in America. And I thank Frank for being a staple of the channel. Thank you. Our Frank. historian. Glad to be Who's going to be here regularly talking about different battles and letting us all know put your input down below uh on and what share you share. share and subscribe yeah please <laughs> we're giving you an education there you go <laughs> take care bye bye thank you semper fi thank you frank